Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first of a number of Formation Night talks. Uh, this is our week one, and we are beginning with the, the, the title, What is the Kerygma? What is the Christian message? So I'll get into explaining what that is. But before we get into that, I would just like to begin with prayer. Uh, whenever I do a talk, I like to do the prayer to the Holy Spirit uh, because I'm hoping that there's a conversion element that comes with, with the talks. So if we let the Holy Spirit work in us, there, that, that, that is always a good thing when you're giving a talk. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, Grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, I chose the first weekend, I mean the first talk, and entitled it Kerygma, the Overview of Faith, because it's the first one, Every, what we learn tonight and what we explore tonight should be the very foundation and basis of every other talk that I give. And if, if you're a catechist, uh, it should be the foundation of everything that is taught in any class. So that's why this is so important. So I'm guessing right off the bat that a lot of people do not know what the word kerygma means because I asked around today and nobody knew what the word kerygma meant. Kerygma is, it means the proclamation, the message. So in referring to Christianity, it is the Christian message. What is that core of the faith? So when St. Paul would have walked into a Greek village or, or city, he would have went to the synagogue and proclaimed a message. What would he have said? And then, for almost every case, he got kicked out of the synagogue and then went to the Greeks, and he proclaimed a message. What would St. Paul have said? That, that core message is what I would like to get at today. Or... Let's think of something that you would may have had experience. Say that you have a friend who was not raised in the faith. They invited you to coffee because they said they have a question. They're sitting across the table from you and they say, Why are you Christian? I don't know what it's about. Explain it to me. And we have to ask the question, are we able to say, this is what the faith is, and explain it in, to them in such a way that it may help them to have a conversion of heart? In other words, we should be able to have that sort of core of our faith, the message of our faith. It is the good news. In fact, there's another way of saying the kerygma, which is the message. We often call it the gospel. In other words, the word gospel means good news. What is the good news? What are we sharing? Uh, and I would, I would often say that gospel and kerygma, we can almost use them interchangeably. So before I actually get into the kerygma, I would like to talk about two different talks that I think every Christian should have in the back of their mind. First of all, before I even get to those talks, my, my thought would be every Christian here, I'd hope that when we ask, what is your identity? Who are you? That Christianity would be part of that. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. That should be part of my identity of who I am. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I walk with Jesus as a friend. I have a life of prayer, sacraments, and loving acts. And, and if, if that's not true, if we're not living that faith, then no matter what we say, it will sound a little flat. So here are the two talks that I think every Christian should have in their, in, in their arsenal. First, 
They should know the story of God. That's what we'll be exploring tonight. What did God do in this world? What is that Christian story? How did God act? What is God's plan of salvation? What is His plan for us? That's the kerygma. So I'm hoping that maybe you'll be able to just say, this is what God's done for me, uh, uh, for us, and have that in your mind. But the second talk that I would think that every single Christian should have is their own personal faith story. In other words, we know the story of God acting in the world, but how has that touched me and my soul and given me personal meaning in life? How has that story touched me? How is my loving relationship with Jesus Christ, how does that change my life? How did my my walking with Jesus in friendship change me? So, that's that intersection of my life with the God story. So those are the two ideas that that as you're proclaiming the faith, as you're sharing the faith, you should have an idea of both. What did God do for the world? And now how am I plugged into that story personally in my own life? So what is the kerygma? What is the Christian message? In its basic form... And this is right from uh, Pope Francis himself. The kerygma is God loves you. It comes down to that. God loves you. And then God acted in this world in a way to save us because He loved us so much. He loved us so much that He gave us His only Son who then went to the cross and offered His life for us. That is the love of God. So everything else I'm going to say is going to be how did God love us? So in this sense, the kerygma, it's not just information. Sometimes we want to just get the facts out. Uh, it's almost the Joe Friday version of the faith. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. I, I, and now, some people are too young to know Joe Friday, but j- just the facts. It's more than facts. It's more than information. It's a proclamation of the gospel that elicits a conversion. We should be able to tell this story in such a way that we'll not be able to hear this message and remain neutral. It calls for a decision that we need to make. It is a call for us to enter in to our relationship with Jesus Christ. When you proclaim the Gospel, my goal would be that the person hearing this would be forced to make a decision for Christ or against Christ. Remember, we have free will. You can go either direction. We need this conversion to Christ, this decision for Jesus Christ, this entering into a relationship of love with Jesus Christ. It is only then can we go deeper into our faith and explore the sacraments, the moral life, um, the, the other, uh, the lives of prayer. We, we need to understand and have that conversion so that we're actually loving Jesus. Otherwise, studying sacraments doesn't mean very much. St. Peter, when he was writing, he wrote in uh, his first letter, chapter 3, verse 15, Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope. If someone walked up to you and said, what's the reason for your hope? That's the question that we're looking at today. So again, what is the kerygma? What is the proclamation? What is the good news? In the first century, uh, uh, in Greece, they used the word gospel already. And what had happened was, if there was a battle, they, uh, and, and say they in, in ancient Greece, and they won the battle, they, as the troops started marching back to their city, they would send out uh, uh, runners. And they would run into the town and say, we won the battle! We won the battle! And that way the city would be ready for the party as the troops marched through. That was the image that Christians wanted to use 
when they went into the cities to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. They were actually, in their minds, saw that they were announcing God's victory over sin, God's victory over death, and God's victory over Satan himself. They were running in to bring the good news of the victory of God, declaring that, that God is overcoming evil in the world. So the core of proclamation was, Jesus died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and is victorious over sin, death, and Satan. So, the early Christian message was basically Easter. Jesus is raised from the dead and saves us. The next thing I would like to say about the proclamation of this proclaiming the victory of God is that the Gospel the message that we preach, it actually has a power to it. People often think, oh, a Christian message, oh, that's boring. We know about that. And there's a respectability. It's safe. It's about being nice. Don't think of our faith just as the Gospel as being safe, respectable, and being nice. Why would governments hunt down Christians and kill them if there wasn't something revolutionary about it? There's something powerful about it that scares people. The Gospel is about the power of God, the power of divine love uh, used to create the world and then to recreate the world in the order of grace. Now remember... When Satan entered the world, with this, there was a great, uh, there was a grab for power, a grab by force. And then we can now talk about the kingdom of the world. Our gospel message is a direct confrontation with the kingdom of this world. Our gospel is about God entering in and God becoming king in order to defeat Satan and the principalities with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness. Yeah, that's directly from St. Paul. We come to Mass every week so that we can receive grace to know our mission, and then to be sent out into the world to fulfill that mission. We are to enter and engage into a spiritual battle against the evil one with all of those principalities. St. Paul wrote to the Romans, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. Romans 1.16. And then he also wrote to the Corinthians, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. The kerygma, the good news of Christianity, is different from all other information Because it's not just facts. It's not just information. We are actually proclaiming the person of Jesus Christ. We are, we are not just communicating ideas. We're not, Christianity is not just about a philosophy or a list of facts. Jesus Christ is a real person. We as Christians are to walk with Him in friendship. There's a question that often comes up on Facebook. Uh, and, and it says, if you could speak with any historical person, who would it be? Now, most people go to their favorite historical figures, but eventually someone always answers, I would like to sit on that park bench and talk with Jesus. That's a good thing. We should want that. But then in a similar vein, there's another question that normally comes right after that. If you could name, if you could sit with any famous person who's living today, who would you talk to? And again, people would come up with their famous people, uh, their, their historical figures or, or sports stars, politicians. 
But with that question, almost nobody ever says Jesus. That is the problem. We see Jesus as a historical figure rather than someone who is active and working in the world today. Remember, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven, into heaven as, uh, as our great high priest who intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. At the beginning of the book of Revelation, St. John records his vision of the risen Christ in glory. And then it says, John fell to his feet. And Jesus responds, do not be afraid. And then explains that he was risen from the dead. When we come to Mass, or when we are in prayer and we're talking with Jesus, yes, it's good to have that idea of that humble Galilean walking down the desert paths from one village to another. However, that's not Christ today. Today, Jesus is in glory on His throne in heaven. He is still part of that God who is love and is still teaching uh, us to be leaders by serving others, so He's still humble. But Jesus is in glory and praying on our behalf. He is perpetually, in the beginning at the cross, offering Himself to His Father totally in perfect love. And we are caught up in that love. Jesus is alive today, and part of the message of this gospel is that relationship with that living Christ. This is Jesus who loves you beyond anything you can imagine. So, since I've talked about Jesus, let's take a look and see what Jesus says. What did Jesus preach? What was his message? If we're going to look at the core of our message, we should see what Jesus has to say. I'd hope we'd think that. It says from Mark, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What was the good news according to Jesus? We need to repent. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. God is breaking into the world. God is becoming our king. That is the good news that we are to believe. Now Jesus continued to proclaim the kingdom of God throughout his entire ministry. In fact, almost all of his parables were were largely about the kingdom of God. The kingdom is something that we should work hard for, like a pearl of great price or a treasure that's in a field. It could be small like a mustard seed, but then will grow and grow and grow. We need to remember, as we look at this kingdom of God, it's not about land. It's not the kingdom of God is over in Jerusalem. The kingdom of God is the relationship between the king and his people. So when we say that God is king, it is all of us united, loving our king and serving our king. So Jesus is king and we are his subjects. St. Paul didn't use the word king. St. Paul used the word Lord. Jesus is Lord. However, in politics of the day, only the Roman emperor was Lord. So to say Jesus is Lord is to say that the emperor is not Lord. It becomes a political statement. I am recognizing that Jesus is my king and I devote my life to serve my king. Jesus also sent 72 others to preach before him. What instructions did he give to them? Whatever town you enter and they welcome you. Eat what is set before you, cure the sick, and then say to them, the kingdom of God is at hand. Same message. Jesus is preaching the kingdom of God. But they were also told to heal the sick. So in other words, their preaching should also include acts of love. So the way we love should be part of the very message itself. 
So now let us go back to the early church and then look at what the early church says. The very first sermon or homily ever preached was in the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and St. Peter began to preach. I would encourage you to read through those early sermons in the Acts of the Apostles and pray with them and know what, what, what was center for those very first Christians. So what did St. Peter say in that first sermon after Pentecost? <coughs> you who are Israelites... Hear these words. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commanded to, commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs which God worked through him in your midst as you yourself know. In other words, the mighty deeds that were all forecast from the Old Testament, they're happening now. How do you know? You've seen them. You people sitting right there, as Peter was saying, you have seen these mysteries of Jesus. Then Peter says, this man delivered up by a set plan and foreknowledge of God. You killed using lawless men to crucify him, but God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death because it is impossible for him to be held by it. That is the core of the message. God had a plan. And in these few verses, Peter explains this plan in reference to King David and how in this plan, Jesus died on the cross and God and raised him from the dead. This mystery is called the Paschal Mystery. The suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the very center and heart. Everything we do and everything we say should be about the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's mentioned in every single one of the Eucharistic prayers. It's the core of our faith, and it's the core of the liturgical year. Our very year, our time itself, and I think we have an entire session on that, is built up on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, the Easter Vigil, and Easter Sunday, the Paschal Mystery. Now when we use the phrase, the Paschal Mystery, it is basically the central mystery of Jesus. Technically, I like to see the Paschal Mystery as the entire Jesus event. The incarnation, his life, suffering, death, resurrection, ascension into heaven, and sending down the Holy Spirit. If you just know those parts of Jesus' life, you've got the gospel almost all set. The incarnation, the, 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 his life, his suffering, death, resurrection, ascension into heaven, and sending of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's it. That's the core. After they heard Peter, uh, they say, it was said that they were cut to the heart. Remember I said that the message is supposed to call for conversion? And, and, and they said, what are we to do? And again, notice that this is a call for action. Peter's response? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The notice that this is central to the whole gospel message. Repent, be baptized, have your life changed. There's action to this. Again, the gospel of God is not just information, facts, and ideas. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ that changes our life. And it says that they accepted the message and 3,000 were baptized that day. Now, I could go through, uh, I, I could go through all of the scriptures, and, and, but just find those sermons yourself. But I want to just understand what God has done in a very simple way that you can remember. One of the fastest ways is something that many of you ca as Catholics may already have memorized. Some of you may have memorized this for, to, for First Communion. Here it is. Why did God create you? 
Everyone who's a little bit older right now in their head is thinking, God created me to know Him and to love Him, to serve Him in this world and to be with Him forever in the next. I said it like that because you memorized it in second grade. And when you would have stood up in second grade class, that's how you would have said it. Why did God create me? God created me to know Him and to love Him, to serve Him in this world and be with Him forever the next. <sighs> Not sure if that sounds familiar, but that almost includes the whole Christian message. God created all of you to know Him and to love Him. So there's that relationship of love. And that relationship and love goes in, in depth so that we can be with God always. That's why that was such an important line to learn before your first communion. Always begin with God. Once you begin with God and you're trying to explain the, your, your Christian faith, begin with who is God, and then after you answer the, who is God, then you can go through these things. God's actions. Creation, fall of humanity, Old Testament, redemption, life in Christ, last things. That is a short list. If you could ever just memorize that short list, you'll be able to explain the Christian message to almost anyone. Uh, so I would encourage you to memorize that. Uh, I'd like to go through those phase, phrases. We'll start with God. Who is God? I please don't have an image of God as an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud. <laughs> uh, so the, sometimes in art they will have that as an image, but your image, I think, we need to go beyond those little artistic images. God, as God, is pure spirit. God is infinitely perfect, existing in Himself. He's outside of time and space. Why? Because He created time and space. Time and space cannot hold God because He created time and space. God is the sovereign Lord of all things. God is one, which means that God is perfect simplicity, but within that oneness is a community of love. So God is one. But within God is a community of love. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now here's why, what it is. If we say that God is love, then we need a lover, someone who is loved, and the love itself. What the, what the Holy Trinity is, is it's, it's, uh, the Father gives all to the Son. The Son gives all back to the Father in total self-giving. The love itself is the Holy Spirit. God is love. And you can't have love unless you have a lover, someone who is loved, and the love itself. So by saying God is Trinity, we are saying God is love. And it's total sacrificial, total self-offering love, not holding anything back. So already, before God does anything else, it is total self-giving love. Always begin with, who is God? I, I was talking with someone who said they didn't believe in God, and I asked why. And they said, because I, I, read, I read the Bible and God's evil. God is a terrible, evil God, and they explain who they think God is. And I'm able to say with all confidence when they tell me that, I don't believe in that God either. I'm not an atheist by saying the God you just explained who is evil. I, I don't believe in that God. I believe in God who is love. We may not understand how it is love, but God is love. We have to begin with that question, who is God? So the first action of God that I want to talk about is creation. This loving God created the, the universe. There's that wonderful poem of creation and how he created it and organized it. So when we, he created out of nothing, 
He created time. He created space. He created life. And he said it was good. Why did he create? God's love. He created out of love. He created because he wanted to love more and wanted to have that love come back and expare the lo- and have that love. Because it is creation, there's beginning, there's end. There's a beginning of creation. And the whole purpose of this creation that God had created was the glory of God. That's it. God created out of his own glory. But God also created humanity. He created humanity with body and soul, which is very odd because our body is part of the material world, but our soul is part of the the immaterial world, the spiritual world. There's an immortal part of us that's connected directly to God. And he looked at us and said, it was very good. Because we were made in the image and likeness of God. We have that that immortal part of us in, in our soul. We are made in the image and likeness of God and have all the dignity that comes with that. And we are called to love God back. God created you to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him in this world, to be with Him forever the next. He created us for love. He created us to share His divine life with us. He filled our souls with His very own divine life so that we share in the divine nature. (coughs) So He created humanity. The second big action. Sin and the fall of humanity. You see, our first parents were seduced by evil. God gave us free will. Why did He give us free will? Because you can't love without free will. I can program a computer to say, I love you, 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 I love you. No matter how much my computer says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, my computer does not love me. I have programmed that computer. To be able to love, you need free will. You need to be able to say, I don't love you. So God gave them free will, and they sinned. They turned away from God. There was the sin of pride. They wanted to be like God. God wanted to give them that divine life, but they decided they wanted to be like God and to take it by force. So what God wanted to give them as gift, they lost because they wanted to take it by force. They had the sin of unbelief because they believed the devil more than God. They had the sin of disobedience. They did what God forbade them to do. They had the sin of ingratitude. In other words, God gave them gifts which they ignored. And in that, this oneness of God where God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden... There was now an infinite gap between God and humanity. That's what sin did. The consequence of sin is death. Now, death in the supernatural world means a separation from God. We lost that divine life that was in our soul. We lost it. We were no longer connected to God. That spiritual life in our soul was gone. Now, we're not talking physical life. We're talking that supernatural life of the soul. Which means that now, because we're separated from God, if we want salvation, we need a Redeemer to save us. So the entire Old Testament is about a preparation, a preparation which includes covenants with God, that includes learning to liturgically sacrifice, how the temple worship, uh, and that whole idea of kingship. Those four things are themes of the Old Testament that, that I think that we should all learn eventually. The one I like to bring up the most is liturgical sacrifice. Because it was a center of all worship. It was a center of all the proclamations of the prophets. It was a center of what the temple and the tabernacle were all about. In fact, even Moses... He, he said, we need to go out into the desert to worship God. 
to make sacrifice to God. So if we don't understand Old Testament liturgical sacrifice, we can't understand how that was fulfilled in Christ. So a sacrifice was offered because God is love. God wanted to teach us to love. So when he went right off the bat, Cain and Abel, one of the first stories of the Bible after sin, they, they had sacrifice. Abel offered the first and the best of his crops. Cain offered what was left over. The whole idea of sacrifice is to offer your best to God as gift so that we can learn to love. The goal is to offer ourselves totally. God, I give you myself. But because we can't literally give self, we give something symbolic of ourselves. That's what the liturgical sacrifice is. It's giving something symbolic to say, I love you, and then teaches us to love. You ever notice that if you love someone, you want to give them a gift? Uh, that, 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 of course, the, you want to give them the best gift, not just gift, the best that you have. So that's what sacrifice was. And well, there would have been sacrifice in that mode even before the fall. After the fall, we also need a propitiary sacrifice. In other words, a sacrifice to overcome sin. There, that's also natural to ourselves. Think about this situation. You got kids. They're playing a video game. Little brother comes running up. Can I play? No. And they keep playing. Can I play? No. Can I, can, can I play? No. And then once he gets annoying, you push him down, he hits his head on the end table, begins to cry. What's the first thing you do? Here, have this. Your first thing when you hurt people is to offer them a gift to try to fix it. Same with God. We have a propitiary sacrifice. We offer a sacrifice for sin in order to fix the situation. Another type of sacrifice is to make a covenant. That was seen in Moses. You make a covenant through, through the sacrifice. And then there's the type of sacrifice that the, that the prophets complained about. God, I want you to do something for me. I'm going to bribe you. Here, have something nice. Now you have to do something for me. That's a pagan understanding of sacrifice. It was been condemned by the prophets over and over and over. And God would say through the prophets, I don't need your, your sacrifices. I don't need the blood of your altars. I, they, I need justice and love. So those prophets were condemning this pagan idea of sacrifice. So what did sacrifice include? You would take the animal. You would kill the animal, cut it all up, prepare it. You would, then you would bring it to the priest. The priest would take the blood of the animal, pour it on the altar as, as a sacrifice and do a priestly mediation. After the priestly mediation, the animal would be prepared and you would share a sacred meal with the, with the, the sacrifice animal. So there, there was three parts of every sacrifice. If you only did one, if you only killed the animal, that's not a sacrifice. If you, if you didn't have the priestly offering, it's not a sacrifice. If it didn't have the meal element, it's not a sacrifice. You needed all three. So when Moses made the covenant on Mount Sinai, he got he gathered all of the, the leaders. He sprinkled the blood on, on the altar. Then he sprinkled it on the people. So you had the, the killing of the animal. You had the priestly offering. And then they, would, they all went up onto the mountain and they ate. And it said that, that there was even thunder because God was present at the meal. They made a sacrifice. They made a covenant. So remember that. This is the Old Testament preparation. Now, the third action that God did is redemption. God came into the world to save us. So the first part is the redemption. Remember, we have the sun here. This is an infinite gap. Humanity cannot cross an infinite gap because we are not infinite. So an infinite being can cross an infinite gap. So the sun entered into the world and became human. That is the incarnation. That is what we celebrate at the Annunciation when, when, when Mary was told by Gabriel, God entered into, the, into her womb and became human. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. The incarnation. 
God is, became truly human, but because he was God, he could he had crossed the gap. Because he is human, he can offer himself for our sins because he is one of us, but because he's God, that offering has infinite power. So he lived his life. He was the new Adam because he had no sin. So he, he, he is the new Adam. And, and he has the power of God to save us. One of the biggest questions that young people ask me is, is Jesus God? Yes. He's God incarnate. God came into the world. So he is fully God and fully human. He's not half God, half human. He's not like a superhero like Hercules. He's fully God, 100% fully God and fully human at the same time. So then, Jesus, in a total act of love, offered himself on the cross as a liturgical sacrifice to God. Do you remember what he said at the Last Supper? This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. So it's a covenant sacrifice. And then he says, why? For the forgiveness of sins. That means it's a propitiatory sacrifice. And then, and, and, and then what do we call that whole event? The Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving. It's a Thanksgiving sacrifice. So Jesus, at that moment of the Last Supper, is saying what I am going to do on the cross is going to fulfill all those Old Testament sacrifices, and I am going to be love incarnate. Remember, I said the whole idea of a liturgical sacrifice is to teach us to love as God loves. So we are learning that through the cross. Satan wanted to control humanity. Matter of fact, through that act, because we were separated from God, he had some sort of control. We don't know how to explain it over all of humanity. But Jesus came into the world and he offered himself and Satan said, I'll give up humanity if I can have God's chosen one. They didn't know, he didn't know he was God. He just thought he was a special person. He thought, if I can destroy God's chosen one, I win. So Satan released all other humanity for Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus, and Satan never understood that he would be raised from the dead and defeat Satan and evil and death. Jesus did not come to end the law, but to fulfill the law. He fulfilled all the sacrifices of the Old Testament, and through His resurrection, so He's back over here without the cross, through the resurrection, uh, he, He was victorious. And then, here's the good part. Here's something exciting. When Jesus ascended back into heaven... Notice what happened. He crosses back over that infinite gap. What does he bring with him in that infinite gap? Who is Jesus? He's fully God, fully human. When he came down, he crossed only as God. When he went back and ascended into heaven, he brought his humanity with him. And our humanity has now crossed the infinite gap. This infinite gap has been closed by the ascension of Jesus into heaven. That's why that was always a holy day of obligation. The infinite gap was covered. Jesus, as our great high priest, fully human, took his his seat at the right hand of the Father. He brought his human, humanity into heaven. And remember, for all eternity, there was that total self-giving of the Father to the Son. Now that total self-giving of the Father to the Son includes his humanity. Which means that with that that happened, he released the Holy Spirit and it flooded the world with the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. Then it flooded the Holy Spirit, the world, and that's where we come to the next action. The Holy Spirit fills the world. It fills every Christian as we are baptized and we receive that grace, but it also creates the church. Grace. Uh, uh, what is that? 
It's the very life of God that can fill our soul. We have God's life within us, and we are, that's called being in a state of grace. That means we are being united to Christ. There is a unity with Christ. Think of every single image of church and every single image of Christianity in the Bible. We are the body of Christ, all connected together and then connected to the head. We are connected to Christ. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. Again, we are united and grafted on. We are connected to Christ. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple and God dwells within us. We are united to Christ. We are children of God because we have God, the God's being in us. We are part of the new covenant because we're connected to Christ and in His family. Everything is saying we are united to Jesus Christ. How do we receive that grace? The normal means to receive the grace of God is through the sacraments. Each one of the sacraments is a direct encounter with Jesus Christ where He gives us His grace. A sacrament is a sign given by Christ that gives grace. And then through that, we are united to each other and formed into the church. And what is Mass? When we gather for Mass as people, all uh, and we gather around the altar... We are then participating in this action of God, of Jesus totally giving Himself to the Father for all eternity, one sacrifice for all time. That, matter of fact, even before, He was always, even as God, total self-giving, one offering. And we participate in that. That is what Mass is about. Is our participation in, in the, in the, in the sacred meal in heaven itself. In the book of Revelation, it talks about this as a meal, but it's basically we are participating in the very love of God on that altar. We are saved from sin? Yes. Grace is, would be the divine life. So God is sharing His divine life with us. That would be called uncreated grace. Basically, the Holy Spirit dwelling within you in your soul. You actually, your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Now, there is, uh, there is, uh, there is, cre- uh, that, 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 that's that, that's grace of the Holy Spirit. There is other grace where Jesus will, uh, will just give you strength, uh, to do certain things. Uh, that, that, that's a different type of grace. But the grace we're talking about here, that sanctifying sacramental grace, we can understand as the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Good question. So we are saved from sin, but we are saved for loving God and loving our other, others. Being saved doesn't only mean what we're saved from. It's what we are saved in order to do. We are given that grace so that we can love as Jesus loves. We are given that grace so that we can love God and love our neighbor. We are given that grace so that we can take this love of the Holy Trinity and bring it into our uh, our own communities and love as God loves because that's what we're called to do. We are called to to love. The last action is the last things. uh, As a matter of fact, this will be our next talk. It will be the four last things. What are they? Death, judgment, hell, and heaven. They're the last things. Now people often say, well, what about purgatory? Well, purgatory isn't a last thing, because it doesn't last. Every person who goes to purgatory ends in heaven. And again, that's, this will be something for next, next time. So death, every one of us will die. Hopefully, if we die in Christ, connected to Christ, in grace, then we will be, it'll be a door to our heavenly Father. If we're united to Christ, death is gain. There will be judgment. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. There is hell. Now some people will say that God is just sending people to hell. Well, hell, uh, hell is what is the absence of God. 
if we have chosen in this life that I do not want God, and we make that choice through our actions, we make that choice through our decisions, God's not going to drag you kicking and screaming to a place you don't want to go. You actually get to choose. I'm going to choose for Christ or against Christ. If you chose against Christ, he's not going to drag you into his, your, his presence against your will. He, he just allows you to live the choice that you have made. And then heaven is seeing God face to face. In the second Eucharistic prayer, it talks about being in the face of God. That's what this is. So recognizing in the, God in his presence. So, in summary, the heart of our faith, God created us for love. There was sin and fall of humanity. And then by His death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven and sending the Holy Spirit, we have been redeemed. And right now, we are living in the age of the church. We are living in the age of the Holy Spirit, growing in holiness as God intended. We are waiting for the second coming of Christ, where where all will be consummated and offered to the Father as gift. Do I have enough time? I got six minutes, so I just also want to mention in doing this, and 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 and, and, and knowing all this, I just want to mention the importance of memorizing some of this. Just taking it, putting it down, and just learning it. If someone wants to learn to paint, how do they do it? They get a famous artist's painting, they set it there, and you take your easel and you copy it exactly. You even look at their brush strokes. And in pure imitation and learning, your, your hand will actually memorize how that was done. And as you learn and do that, you will become a better artist. Same thing with music. You take other people's music and you pray, play it over and over again so that it becomes part of your very muscles that you have. Just, just think of the first time you ever played uh, an instrument, plunk, plunk, you had no memory muscle. But later, you're just automatically playing. We must imitate others and memorize. If you want to le- That's how I learned to give speeches I, and talks. I actually took some other famous talks and I memorized them and sort of imitated them until I learned to talk in public. I wasn't always a good speaker. I still may not be a good speaker, but that's how I, I, I practiced. So if you want to evangelize, maybe memorize a little scripture. Maybe memorize some prayers and psalms. Maybe memorize your witness story about, about how would you explain this to someone else and how God has touched your life, your personal conversion story. Or uh, other reasons why to memorize. You'll have the information always with you. You won't have to look it up. You can just talk and know it. It's always there. So if you are sitting at the grocery store in line and you want to pray the Te Deum, you are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father and all creation worships you. You have it. Also, the act of memorization itself is a prayer. You take one line and you say it over and over and over and over and over again until you have it memorized. Then you move to the second line and you say those two lines over and over and over and over again until you have it memorized. And the act of memorization itself becomes a prayer. And lastly, if you take the Jesus story and do what we did and memorize it, you'll have the gospel with you always. And the same gospel that has power to help others has the power for us. I wanted the first night to discuss, to, to discuss the kerygma, the gospel, so that next week, uh, next month when we come here, I'm going to refer back to this gospel message, this kerygma. Or uh, in the weeks to come, I'm going to refer back to this. Everything in our faith, anytime you discuss theology, every time you discuss our Christian teaching, if you discuss the sacraments, prayer, this is what we need to know or it won't make sense. So with that, 
uh, that's, uh, that's the talk. Any questions at all? See, I didn't give you a chance to think about questions. But, yep. Well, I just don't know if I answered a question to a girl that's not Catholic, but uh, she's very faithful and we talk about religion a lot. And she said that uh, about Jesus up on our cross. Yes. He came down and redeemed us and, and he shouldn't be on the cross anymore. And I say, I hope I said this right. I didn't know what to say. You know, we were just co-workers and I said, we, I view Jesus up on the cross that he is um, suffering because of all the sin in the world and we see him up there knowing the suffering he has done for us. So I don't know yeah. if I did that. The, the, for those uh, on, on, uh, who are watching, uh, she asks, what about the cross of Jesus? Should Jesus be on the cross with the body or should it be an empty cross? And it's pretty much, we shouldn't be ashamed of the cross. In the cross, Jesus did die in the cross. So that, that, that's something we should all know. And it has been part of our Christian artistic tradition from the very beginning. Uh, there, there are, are crosses with Jesus on the cross, on, on the tombs of the catacombs. So it's always been part of our tradition. So that's something we always look at. But the other thing is, Jesus for all eternity has been perpetually offering himself to the Father. So seeing Jesus on the cross reminds us of that eternal self-giving of the Son in love. It's actually a picture of God's love. That's why we have that. You can have a plain cross, but, but having the corpus on the cross is also a wonderful symbol. So what you said is a good thing. Anything else? In that case, hopefully maybe there's some discussion afterwards. And thank you very much. <laughs>